Hello and welcome to the 44 Minutes of Heaven we call the D1 Baseball Podcast. I am your host, Michael Patrick Rooney. Tonight's episode brought to us by our good friends at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from youth levels all the way to the pros. It's about getting an assessment on what kind of swing decisions you're making. I think about someone like Blake Burke, who has made massive improvements on the type of hitter he is. Always been very talented, but the swing decisions have improved greatly. Uh, S2 is the technology you want as far as making better swing decisions. I want to also say thank you to Pitch Logic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play, from youth leagues to the big leagues. It's easy to use and affordable technology. The platform is accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features use at the highest level of our game. See pitchlogic.com for more information. Uh, the great Aaron J. Fit is at a Bruce Springsteen concert, which is awesome with his father. Uh, so that leaves me with the great uh, Joe Healy of the Joe Joe Joes and Kendall J. Rogers. Uh, Kendall's team doesn't really have a name. Maybe the Klein Bengals. Does your weekly picks team have a name, Kendall? Um, not really. No. Mar- Martha's, Martha's Mallers. Cut and maybe. shoot cutters. Oh, the cut and shoot cutters. That's even better. I thought he was um, going to go like the Washington football team, the Kendall Rogers weekly picks team. That's what he should call it. <laughs> yes. Now, now we all know that our weekly picks every week are brought to us by, uh, I'm going to try to say it, Chinook Seeds? Chinook Seedery. Look at you. Yeah. You are no right. David Seifert. Yeah, very good. Uh, and so, you know. Seifert like, would have said Chinooki or something. <laughs> Chinook. Zanook or Chinook. something. But, um, uh, <laughs> Oh gosh, it's, it's, it's Sife saying Jack Caglione's name is is all time great. Not uh, as good as Casey O'Pete's though. Yeah, that was that was. You know, that he, was, was just a, he was just an all American catcher and all. You know. Yes, Casey O'Pete's was the goat of mispronunciations. So anyway, gentlemen, let me let me let me set the stage. The the fabulous mm-hmm. Rune Dogs had a banner nine and one week, and in what I thought was a tough slate, and um and that puts us one game above defending champion Etheridge Farms. Um, in the weekly standings, 10 games ahead of Aaron J. Fit, by the way, 10 games ahead of Fitzy's team, um, give or take. Uh, so, Joe, I'm, I'm told that Etheridge Farms has a statement that you're going to read on their behalf. Uh, indeed, yes. Thank you for this time, Runes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I received this notice from uh, my colleague, Mark Etheridge of Etheridge Farms, and he would like me to read it out um, at this time. Um, okay. Uh, to whom it may concern, recently I have learned the results of our weekly picks game, of which I have dominated for several years, have come into question. <laughs> I would like to admit now that I've used the cream, but not the clear, and crucially, <laughs> neither substance entered my body knowingly. I hope this puts to bed the rumors about performance-enhancing drugs at Etheridge Farms. We will take no further questions at this time. Thank you for your privacy. Oh, gosh. Pretty good. Yeah, that's great. So, so confirmed. Etheridge Farms has been cheating all these years. They've been winning championships. Um, certainly, there will be yeah, no Ruth, investigation because well, then they'd Ruth be sued. Doing so well this year, I'm wondering who his interpreter is. <laughs> uh, you know what? You know what is interesting is this week I picked nine of the series and I couldn't decide on ODU versus JMU, and so I left it blank and then got busy. And then Chris Gennaro. Um, by the way, is it Air or R? I I, I go. Gennaro. 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 That's how I kind of like Ed Gennaro from uh, Unnecessary Roughness. Even better. So, so the great Chris Gennaro, <laughs> uh, he he did uh, he messaged me and said, "Hey, your picks are incomplete." So I am grateful for that. Oh um, wow! See, he wouldn't do that for me. I think he would. I think he would do it for all of us. I did appreciate UCSD. I was the only one that picked them, and they said I left my crown behind. That was a great tweet. You're so, you're a noted Tritons homer. Yes, that's right. I did. I showed you guys the text. I, I texted Ben Orloff, my my pre-series apology for picking against them. And he texted back, which was hilarious. He said, they scored 22 runs against us in a fall game. I think my team thinks I'm picking against them too. So that was, it was great. Ben O. We able to show our faces uh, down there on the mean streets of La Jolla. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta watch our backs, you know. Watch your backs down there. Oh, boys, let's jump right in. All right, so we so we have we have things to talk about. So there are five weekends left in the college baseball regular season. That is it. Five weekends, and then we'll do conference tournaments, and then to the postseason. So the the big, I think, the number one conversation. We'll do the SEC first. 
we have a new number one. Texas A&M is the number one team. They've overtaken Arkansas. And so, Kendall and, and Joe, I want—I didn't get to participate in the rankings talk last night because uh, I was on a plane. But you guys did an incredible job as always. So let me—I'm gonna—I'm gonna present something to you. What's interesting about Arkansas and A&M is that they both have lost one series and one series only, and it, it was a road SEC series. A&M lost the series at Florida and that early, you know, week one of SEC play. And then this weekend, um, Arkansas lost their series at Alabama. So, you know, like there's a little bit of pole mechanics there. Like you have to have something to go on and it just, there's a recency there. However, I think here's the real argument. Arcan- I'm going to argue that Arkansas's pitching is better than A&M's pitching. So let me, I'm just going to put that there and you can, you can debate that. I'm also going to argue that A&M's offense is better than Arkansas's offense. So then the question becomes, what are the deltas? And I think the argument for AM at number one is that AM's offense is more significantly better than Arkansas's offense a, a com- compared to the delta between Arkansas pitching and AM pitching. Do you guys think that's a fair way to slice it up? Uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, I, I got crossed up. I didn't know if Kendall was going to jump in there. But yeah, no, I. I think that is totally fair. That that's how I would phrase it too. I, I think Kendall agrees with me that, that generally speaking, right now, Texas A and M is the more well well rounded of the two teams. Um, I think we saw this past weekend when look when when Arkansas um, doesn't keep the opponent at you know just one or two runs as they so often have this season. Like they they can they can get got. They're a little bit vulnerable there. Now, what I would say is a little bit of counter to to that runes, and I don't know if I. I agree with this. I'm just throwing it out there as kind of the counter is that being better on the mound might just have more value in today's college baseball. Even if, even if the gulf is bigger between the offensive units, um, being better on the mound in a world where being good on the mound is rare in college baseball. I think there might just be more value in that because as I've always said, when you get into a regional, a super regional in Omaha, Nothing to me matters more than who do you have throw in game one and how how likely do you think you are to win that game? I would refer you now a very different team because their offense was great too. But think about how LSU went into every series in the postseason last year, basically one and oh. Yeah. Right. And like yeah. Hagen Smith is more or less on that path, right? So that would kind of be my counter is that like they have such a trump card there, not just Hagen Smith, but their day one arms. That yeah. when we start to think about it from a postseason perspective, I think that could be an advantage. So here, here's something that's really interesting, and we were we were talking about this on the runes. We were talking about this on the on the uh, top twenty five call last night. Is like I'm the first person, right? When we we discuss like top starters in the SEC, that like I like Ryan Prager. Like I don't obviously he's not in like the same ballpark as like a Hagen Smith. But the thing about Prager, man, like one point nine ERA, seventy three strikeouts, dude has five walks in fifty innings. Like he's been incredible and like, it's almost one of the more like under the radar, great starting seasons I've ever seen. Cause you wouldn't really put him in that upper echelon of like all American type of arms, but he's having a cl- very clear cut all American season. And I think when you look at that and you look at the fact that, uh, you know, Evan Ashenbeck is the top reliever in college baseball out of the bullpen, Chris Cortez last weekend, guys. I mean, that's a big storyline. 15 strikeouts in eight innings uh, and two two appearances, uh, you know, last week, one in midweek against UTSA and then one against Vanderbilt. You know, his his kind of progress as a pitcher, you know, you know Brad Rudis, they dropped his arm slot, Shane Sadeo from the left side. So on top of A&M's lineup, you know, the, the starting pitching, certainly Arkansas is an advantage. But you're starting to look at A&M's bullpen and go, does Arkansas have an advantage in the bullpen? I'm not so sure they do right now. Yeah, it's it's um, man, it's so interesting. I, when you were saying that too, Kendall, I was thinking about Prager. Like, what a yeah. perfect Friday night guy for that team. Where if you just don't give it away, your offense can probably go win the game. Like the like Prager is having a Thomas Eshelman like strike throwing season, and That's there's great. still a long That's way cool. to go. But like, if you have an elite offense behind you and you just don't give up free stuff you're going to win almost every single game. So he really is, you know, whatever the, the – Well, so but. here's one. Here's another way to look at this, right? And 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 I'm with you guys. Like, honestly, like you could make a case for both these teams. But I think about it this way too. Like, if you put Prager on Arkansas's team and you put Hagan Smith 
on a and team, like who, who would need Hagen Smith more? And Arkansas would definitely be that team that would need a Hagen Smith more than A&M would. Because A&M, like A&M could have a Friday night guy right now that has an ERA of three and a half, four, and they would still probably be winning the same number of games. Yeah, the offense is crazy. Let me give you three other things that happen in the SEC. Sure. That uh, and you guys pick, pick, uh, go wherever you want with it. So, um, Jack Caglione has homered in six straight games. He's up to twenty home runs. Um, Charlie Condon's at twenty four, which, by the way, is more home runs than sixty six other Division One teams. If Charlie Condon was a team, he'd be out home range sixty six other teams. <laughs> but Cags is coming in hot, man. Like, or coming on hot, I should say, which is interesting. LSU is now three and twelve in the SEC, which is which means that they're trending to not make the NCAA tournament, which is more craziness. Uh, and the other thing I want to mention is Ole Miss and Mississippi State had a really awesome, hotly contested series, and and Ole Miss won the series in really dramatic fashion. And I just I, we don't root for teams, obviously, and you know like. We love Chris Lamonis. We love Mike Bianco. We love both those coaching staffs. Like they're 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 really good people in our game. But I have to say that I was very happy for Ole Miss and their coaching staff because they hadn't won a series against Mississippi State since 2015, I think it was. That's almost a decade. And I, I feel like that streak, it's a testament to how good Mississippi State has been, but it's also a misnomer for Ole Miss. Like Ole Miss has been better than that. And I feel like they've been dragging that streak around like some dead body. And, and so like in, in some ways, I'm happy for Ole Miss that, you know, Mike Bianco gets tossed out of a game and it almost felt like that uh, was a catalyst, a positive catalyst for Ole Miss. So go ahead. I'll, I'll clear the floor here. You're muted, Kendall, if you're going. Yeah, so I'll go. I'll go to the Ole Miss Mississippi State series. Uh, just a really fun series. Everything you want a rivalry series to be, right? But I guess the only thing was missing is that like high end stakes, right? If they were both top ten teams or what have you. I, my question with Ole Miss will moving forward will be how much of this was kind of you put together a good weekend and how much is sustainable moving forward. Now I'm not saying none of that is sustainable. I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of Mason Nichols and the rotation moving yep. forward and why the heck not? Because Ole Miss has tried just about everything else this season. So we'll, we'll have to see. Cause I guess I'm a little dubious. I, I too am, ha you know, you'd never want to see a team just kind of like go through a slog of a season, especially two years in a row, considering they won six sec games last season. Um, yeah. You just don't, you don't, you never want to see a team go through that twice. But, uh, but I, I do wonder if it was a good weekend or if maybe there is something else here in, in the big picture, it does set up a pretty competitive race for those spots in Hoover because, you know, it, it doesn't take much to kind of fall back to the pack. You're talking about LSU is in that mix. Ole Miss is in that mix. Uh, you know, we thought Missouri was like a lock to miss Hoover, but now they're playing a lot better baseball. They're frisky. Yeah. They have LSU at home this weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like th that, th that race to make it to Hoover is, is going to be hotly contested because I think it's a little more competitive than we anticipated it being. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, we talked about LSU. Uh, I mentioned LSU and Missouri this weekend. I mean, LSU is a really interesting team to me because you know we've we've said this like nonstop, but they're one of those teams that when they've they've pitched, they haven't hit, and when they've they've hit, they haven't pitched. And you know, over the weekend, guys, like if you would have told me that LSU gave up six runs and three runs the first two games against Tennessee, I would have definitely told you they they won at least one of those games. They didn't lose. They didn't win either of those games, and so. Uh, I mean, they're just really, really, in, you know, they're inconsistently inconsistent. Uh, and, you know, that's really killed them. And, and, and frankly, I mean, if you look at their posts, so somebody asked today in the chat. Uh, we, you can go check out our transcript of our chat. Me and Joe chatted today. Uh, took a lot of your questions. Somebody asked me, hey, where do you see LSU finishing conference? Guys, here, here is where LSU is right now. They've got three wins in conference. Okay, so here's how I've got them finishing out the season. I want your take on this. I've got them winning the series at Missouri, two out of three, so they're five and thirteen. I've got them winning a home series against Auburn, uh, two out of three, seven and fourteen. I've got them losing two out of three to eight in my home, eight and sixteen. I've got them losing two out of three to Alabama at nine and eighteen, and I've got them winning the Ole Miss series and going eleven and nineteen. So, looking at that, either you've got to take the Alabama series or the a m series, or you've got to sweep one of Auburn and Missouri to really put yourself in a 
I mean, in a somewhat decent position, and they're and they're not operating from a strength, an, a position of strength from an RPI standpoint right now either, because that's that's plummeted. Joe, what say you on that? Yeah, I think that's about right. And and for what it's worth, you if you use the tool over at Warren Nolan, he has like the you know predicted record. He projects them to go eleven and nineteen in conference as well. So uh, it, it just shows that they they've dug. They've dug too deep a hole to be able to just do what's expected the rest of the way. They're going to have to do something extra, right? We we knew these first 15 games were going to be tough, but that meant, you know, they go seven and eight, right? Or, or what have you, not that they're three and 12. Like that was just never on the table, at least for yeah. me going into it. So now they're, as Kendall mentions, like they're going to have to pick up games somehow. And, and it's just hard to, hard to do that. I mean, you just, you don't just waltz in and play a, a C plus game and expect to win any games, especially in, in road series. So they, they got to hustle. Like that's the understatement of the century, but that's where they are. Yeah. yeah. And if their RPI is, you know, if their RPI is what 45 to 50 going into Hoover and they're at 11 wins. I mean, they're going to have to go on a run. You know, I think, it, I think A&M last year, I want to say A&M had 13 wins and they might've been like, a, like 30 to 35. I mean, their RPI wasn't bad. Uh, and they got in, but I think LSU would actually have to, if they were 11 or 12 wins, I don't think just getting to like 13 is going to get them in. I think they're going to have to go on a little bit of a run there to get in. Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. It, it does create, it does create a situation where Hoover could be really interesting this season. Um, yeah. You know, last season was unique in that every team in Hoover either was pretty comfortably in the field, even A&M because of the RPI, you felt pretty good about. And then there were teams that you just knew had to win it all to get in. Like, Georgia and Missouri, right? And so there was like no in between. There was no bubble controversy whatsoever last year in, in Hoover. Um, you know, and this year I think it could be a lot different, especially as you see the top is starting to kind of separate. You know, we, we've got, you know, uh, Arkansas and, and Kentucky and I think AM starting to kind of separate themselves. So I do think there's going to be a little more bubble intrigue in Hoover, which is for me a, a welcome thing because I, I do like when you can add some stakes to the conference tournaments. Yeah, and two more things real quick on LSU. Number one, you know, Tommy White becoming a really good defender is something I did not have on my bingo card, but he has been very good defensively over there. The other thing I thought was interesting, and Joe, I don't know if you if you saw this quote, but uh, Koki Riley wrote a story after yesterday's game, and Jay Johnson made a really interesting comment I'm kind of wanting y'all's take on too, about basically saying like, hey, like I wish we had a Christian Moore. Like I wish we had a player like that in our lineup. And I just thought that was really interesting is like the coach at LSU – Saying like, I wish we had a Christian more. Like it's just, I thought that was very interesting to me from Jay Johnson. Hmm, that is interesting. I I think like if I if I was to interpret that, which is unfair, but let me let me just be clear. I'm speculating right now. The one thing like you know LSU's clearly got talent. I wish they were a little bit more seasoned. Like this team feels like when I yeah. watch LSU play, they look like a bunch of kids that just met each other on Tuesday. Like they just don't seem very connected or, and like, I don't know who the leader of that team is. I know who the best player is. The best player is Tommy white, but he's not like that. Hey, everybody charge the hill behind me guy. He's just a great player is, is what Tommy white is. And so like Christian Moore is the guy, like if you're coaching against Tennessee, your eyes are on him. Like he's an agitator. He's a disruptor. And by the way, he's an excellent player. Like he's, so I guess I kind of get that. Is that your take Joe? Yeah, I think I think that's fair. I mean, obviously we we don't we don't know, but I, I think it's sometimes we can underestimate the importance of some of the glue guys. I think about last year's Ole Miss team, and there were a lot of reasons why last year's Ole Miss team didn't it didn't go well. But it's easy to kind of underestimate losing, you know, Tim Elko and Kevin Graham and Justin Bench, you know, as not even just good players, all they were, but just kind of like steady veterans who'd been there and mm -hmm. done that and were unflappable and had been in leadership roles. Whereas this LSU team, it kind of feels like to your point runes, they've got other than Tommy white, they've got guys who were around last year, but weren't the, the key cogs last year. You know, Hayden Trevinsky came on late. Sure. But for the most part, the guys who are back from that other than Tommy white are kind of role players. And then you've got new guys. And so it does feel a little like if we're going to play amateur psychologist here, it does feel a little bit like a team that is kind of looking around at each other, kind of going like, who's going to, who's going to step up and no one's saying it because they, you know, that stuff tends to not get spoken. It just gets internalized, but it, it does, it does feel like me to that, that like that to me as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Can I'll also make, oh, go ahead, here, go ahead, go ahead, Rins. 
No, I was going to say, and if you're if you're afraid of the dark, this is not the league for you, right? Like this is really this is question. not the league for uh, yeah, like for youth. Go ahead, Kr. One, one well, one more SEC thought. Can I tell you a team that's not afraid of the dark is Kentucky. Uh, guys, they're fourteen and one. They have Tennessee at home this this coming weekend. Which will be. I mean, explosive. we talked about this last week, but if they win this series, like they're like a slam dunk top eight potentially, like in, in the middle of April. Uh, if they take that series at home this weekend, Kentucky leads the SEC in batting average guys, and they're third in the SEC in a home runs hit, which is which I th- think is really interesting behind A and M Tennessee. Yeah, Joe, let me make a comment about Kentucky, and you can dispute this or go wherever you want. My only concern for Kentucky is that they're playing so well now that is it too early to be this hot? Um, you know, like, and it's almost like a, an upgraded version of TCU the first three weeks of the season where like you just have played out of your mind. And, and I, I don't say that to say Kentucky's not good. They're good. Like I like their pitching. I love their defense. I like their athleticism and physicality, but it does feel like they're on a heater right now. Yeah. They, I mean, they really are. I, I I've said it before on this podcast. Like they just, I think they think they're the best team in the country. Mm. and that's that's a powerful thing what I, what I would say so i i generally would agree with you runes i do think there is going to be a stretch of time because it happens to every team no matter how great where they just don't play as well um what i would lean on though if i'm kentucky and i'm, I'm thinking about that what i would lean on is okay maybe we're not going to be second or third in the sec and home runs and sec play the rest of the way like maybe that tails off right like ryan nicholson is hitting home runs at a clip better than anybody except Braden Montgomery in SEC play. Like maybe that stuff's not sustainable, right? But they can kind of lean back on the other things they do well. Like they really haven't had to do that much bunting. I mean, if you look at the stats, they're not, I mean, last year they had like three times as many sacrifice bunts as anyone else. It's not the case this year. Now they're still running, but so it's a situation where the, if the at-bats get worse, if the approaches kind of get a little wonky, if you're Nick Mingione and his staff, you can take a step back and say, like, let's get back to what our bread and butter is. And, and so they they do have a gear shift I think they can make, which is is valuable because a lot of – you get some of these grip and rip teams. I, I think this floor is a decent example of this. Some of these grip and rip teams, the strikeouts start to pile up. You know, you, you get flyouts to the warning track. You're frustrated. I mean, I saw plenty of that in, in Columbia, Missouri two weekends ago. And there's really, it feels like you're trapped. Like there's really nowhere else to go. I, I think Kentucky has options that a lot of other teams don't, which is why their ability to kind of be something different this year, I think is so valuable. Rins, one thing I thought you pointed out, you, you talked about this with LSU, just the, the, you know, how it didn't seem like they were like particularly close team, real vocal, and, you know, the, the ability to come back and things like that. The one thing I do like about Kentucky, and it really the same kind of applies to AM, i I'll kind of point, point to both of these teams real quick. Over the weekend, AM got down, I think it was 5 nothing to Vanderbilt early on in the series finale. You're thinking, oh, okay, Vanderbilt's going to actually still win. All of a sudden, you know, the, the final was, what, 12-6. to a and goes on a, on a run offensively in the middle of that game. Kentucky guys got down 7 nothing against Auburn over the weekend. And it was like all of a sudden Kentucky just, like, flipped a switch. I, I think when teams can do that, that tells me a lot about the clubs because it's like, hey, when we, when we need to flip the switch, we can flip the switch. And that just tells me like just how you know lead of teams those two teams are. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's two things about Kentucky. Uh, Coach Fern and I talked to uh, Todd Walker today, and you know he was doing SEC now all weekend. And um, you know Todd said I didn't realize this, Joe. You probably knew this, but like Kentucky's so loose right now. Devin Burks. First of all, Devin Burke's sitting third and he's sitting 230. Like he's their worst hitter by far. And like that just tells you how much, you know, up in a tree they are right now. But Devin Burks, when he comes into the dugout after he hits, he doesn't put his own gear on. The team puts his gear on like a pit <laughs> crew in NASCAR and they time it, which is, you know, like so indicative. They also, he also said that the team has these invitations of Nick Mingione, who's very much, uh, you know, like a, um, there's there's a word for this joe like you know nick nick minge owns a colorful character right and so just the fact that minge has you know a, a healthy enough um uh, self-esteem to be able to tolerate that and like you know again like kentucky's just in a great place mentally is what i'm trying to say yeah it's a, it's a loose dugout like i mean you notice that even from afar like they those guys are having a good time and you know, it's easy to when you're when you're playing well, but um, and they certainly are. So, you know, kudos to them. It's fun to watch.
Yeah, and and them versus Tennessee, them going to uh, I can't remember who's going where, but uh, actually it's in Lexington, Tennessee. That, that is going to be one of the series of the year so far. It'd be awesome. Let's go to the ACC boys. So let me give you a couple headlines, sure. and then we can we can pick from this in the ACC, and then we'll take a a quick break. So NC State won a home series at Clemson. Clemson had a one in three weeks. So that was that was. Um, that was noteworthy. Virginia's offense keeps rolling. Louisville did take a game, but Virginia's offense is just comical. Um, Nick Kurtz now has 13 home runs in his last nine games. Like he is officially healthy and raking. And then Florida State swept the series against Miami. Florida State is went six and zero this year versus Florida and Miami. It's the first time since 1960 that the Seminoles have not, you know, they've gone six and zero versus Miami and Florida, which is. Just crazy when you think about that. Go wherever you want, boys. Any of those headlines grab you, or or if you use something different. Well, I, I hate to do this, but I actually have to give uh, Aaron Zebediah Fitz some credit on the weight call. Uh, he did say a couple weeks ago he felt like it was coming for those guys, and they are playing at a really high level. I kind of wrote about Kurtz a little bit today on the Rogers Rewind, but uh, you know, in ACC play, guys, Kurtz is now hitting 348, 10 home runs, 21 RBIs, and a 1.109, uh, you know, OPS. You know, Chase Burns continues to throw well. Josh Hartle, guys, had a really encouraging start over the weekend uh, for Wake Forest. And this weekend, they have Wake, uh, Florida State at home. So uh, I, I'm not ready to say Wake is the team that we thought they'd be coming in this season, but they're certainly – seems like they're climbing that ladder a little bit. And this weekend will kind of tell us a lot. I'm fascinated by Virginia. I mean, if you yeah. really want to, like, zoom way out on Virginia, it's it's – you go back to – 10 years ago. And if you told me, Hey, 10 years from now, Virginia is going to have real questions on the mound and, but they're going to be one of the most physical offenses in, in the country. I would have not believed you. Right. Cause that was just, this is so different from what their program MO was when they, when they really started getting rolling, but that's kind of where we're at. I mean, this offense is as good as is really certainly as good as any in the, in the ACC. And I would put it up there with the Tennessees and the A&Ms of the world in terms of, different looks, physicality, athleticism, all that stuff. And, and I got asked in the chat today about concern about the pitching staff. And look, I'm seeing what you're seeing. If you're concerned about the pitching staff, like I, I I'm with you. However, we've talked about this before. Like I'm kind of living in a post worried world about some of that stuff. I mean, look, this is year four or five in a row of Virginia having a pitching staff like this, which is kind of made up of mid-major transfers up and pitch ability guys and and what have you. And they've been to Omaha two of the last three years. So sometimes it's been that stars have stepped up. Who could forget Griff McGarry, just like flipping a switch in 2021 and becoming one of the best pitchers in the country. But also it's just kind of knowing who they are and just pitching to what they have and, and figuring it out that way. So I, uh, while I can understand why someone might look at it and, and be a little bit worried. And I, I don't love that their best arms are some of the ones with the worst numbers. Jack O'Connor, Jay Wolfolk, Aiden Teal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just have a lot of confidence that they're, they're, it's going to be enough because it just has been so often with them. Yeah. Uh, two takeaway thoughts for me on the ACC, and then we'll take a break and we'll go to the Big 12. I just, I, I am so excited to see the ACC in the postseason because they seem so up for it as a league. Like, I just, I feel like the top of the ACC is thicker and deeper and tougher than uh, it's been in a long time. Like, there's just a bunch of teams that feel like they have Omaha upside, and I'm fired up for that. The other thing I want to say is, you know, Florida State, when they hired Link Jarrett a couple years ago, I don't think it was a layup. You know, like, he had taken Notre Dame to Omaha, and he was the coaching candidate. And to me, Florida State had to write a check to, to, to secure Link Jarrett that was probably uncomfortable. You know, like they had to make him probably a higher paid coach than they wanted to, you know, or, or then was in the budget, if you will. And it was absolutely the right play. It, you know, if it was uncomfortable, I'm assuming it was. Good on you, Florida State, for doing that because this dude is so good. And, you know, like between James Tibbs, who's going to be a first round pick this year, and I think Jamie Arnold will be a first round pick next year. I mean, man, I just, I just think Florida State, it was a one year blip, and here we go. Yeah, that that doesn't what they've done this year honestly doesn't shock me that much. I mean, we all kind of thought they would be he would be instant success there last year, and obviously things didn't work out for him. But you know, you look at the job that Arnold has done. You know his you know his numbers are great, but like he's got electric stuff. You know, James Tibbs has taken a big step forward and, and whatnot. So yeah, man, they're they're an exciting club. And you know, on the flip side, 
uh, you look at Miami, we, you know, we were talking about this earlier today, you know, Miami, I don't, I don't think they're a bad team, but you know, they're, they've got a losing record now. So, you know, you talk about, you know, some of the blue bloods in college baseball, you know, you got Florida kind of teetering on the edge a little bit in terms of potentially missing the postseason. You got LSU, you got Miami, Stanford, UCLA, uh, and Texas isn't, isn't clear right now. So, I mean, think of those kind of brand names that are potentially out of the tournament this year as of today. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. ASU, Arizona State. And they're, yeah, they're, Arizona like, State. they're out, out right now. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Hey, boys, let's do this. Let's, uh, we're going to talk about the Big 12 in a second. But one thing I want to do is tell everybody that uh, postseason baseball is right around the corner. We mentioned that. This year's Phillips 66 Big 12 Championship. Remember, it's the only conference tournament in college baseball that's held at a big league stadium. It's May 21st to the 25th. It's crazy that conference tournaments start on May 21st. Ten teams will qualify for the Big 12 title. Climate Control Globe Life Field, home of the Texas Rangers, as you know. And if you're going, you can even ele elevate your experience with new premium ticket options. There's premier seats. There's club access, complimentary perks. Secure your tickets today by going to globelifefield.com slash big12, globelifefield.com slash big12. Kendall and I have been there the last couple of years. It is absolutely awesome. Uh, you won't regret it. So uh, let's take a break right now, and we will come back and talk about the Big 12. All right, boys, let's do let's do the large 12, if you will. So I'll give you a couple headlines. TCU had a nice rebound weekend. Uh, they won the series over a very hot Texas Tech team. Uh, Oklahoma swept Kansas State. West Virginia swept UCF. Maybe more importantly, J.J. Weatherhold is back playing. He's dh By the way, he was on base five times in the Sunday game. And then Oklahoma State just keeps doing their deal. They swept Cincinnati. Man, th this Big 12 race is, is chaotic in like the funnest, most – awesome way so go ahead boys what, what, what say you about the big 12 yeah I, I will say this about the big 12 you know i thought that even a week ago guys i felt like the big 12 was like totally wide open i feel like the cream is rising to the top a little bit here i feel like west virginia ou and oklahoma state kind of look like your contenders you know oklahoma state the last few weeks has been the most consistent team west virginia i thought aaron had some really good stuff on on Derek clark and weather hold over the weekend uh you know they were, they were playing really well then oklahoma you know, they get swept by Lamar. They lose a series to Oklahoma State, but they look really good against Kansas State. And by the way, John Spikerman is about to come back. So, know. you know, looking at the, you know, WVU, OU at 11 and 4, Oklahoma State at 10 and 5. And then, guys, I just feel like, I mean, after that, it's Texas, Baylor, Texas State, Kansas State. I just feel like there's a drop off there, especially, you know, Kansas State. I think we all think they're talented, but I mean, they're now three games back of Oklahoma State. They're four games back of those top two teams. So you're starting to see a little bit of separation. You know, you mentioned TCU. I think we all like their, you know, we really like their personnel. Uh, but TCU, fellas, they're six and a half games out of first place right now with some work to do, though they have a good RPI. So I think the biggest storyline for me, Runes, is the fact that, you know, West Virginia is surging. I think Oklahoma now has kind of regained their footing. Oklahoma State has been ultra consistent across the board. They're pitching at a really high level. And so I think we have three teams now that are in that mix for that cheap, that that number one spot in the Big 12. And we didn't think that, you know, that was a done deal about a week ago. I think we do now to some extent. Part of the reason why the, the reason why this conference race is going to be fun is also why it might be problematic for the Big 12 from a postseason yeah. standpoint is that they don't they don't have any teams and this is a big league because you know Texas and Oklahoma are still there plus the teams that came in so it's a big league right now and nobody's really rolling over right I mean Houston's in last place and like that's not a bad team they've got yeah, they got a really I mean, good Friday guy. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. They've got some pitchers. Like if BYU yeah. has been BYU and Baylor have been a lot friskier than either of us thought they would be. Any of us thought they would be. But that's kind of problematic again because you know Baylor is over 500 in Big 12 play and has an RPI over 100. And that that hurts not just from the standpoint of like losing to them could hurt your RPI, but also from the standpoint of that takes wins away from teams that you know, could be higher up in the standing. So Baylor finishing fourth in the league, while that would be a good story, you know, for, for folks like us who didn't think much of Baylor coming into the year, it's bad for the Big 12 because if their RPI is 85 and they finish fourth in the league, that's probably not a postseason team. So if K-State finishes fifth mm -hmm. but has a better RPI, does that team get in or do they get punished because they finished fifth, you know? Um, I'm fascinated by that, but I also understand why for coaches and Big 12 folks, that is frustrating. 
Yeah, can I tell you something that's problematic for the Big 12 guys? And, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute uh, on the Pac-12 as well because it's really bad, the Pac-12. But you talked about just the teams beating up on each other. And some people may go, okay, well, the, well, you'll always talk about how the SEC teams are beating up on each other, so what's the difference? Well, here's the difference in terms of the RPI race between these two conferences. The SEC and the ACC teams at a conference have won 80% of their games. The Big 12 fell is 66%. So the RPIs had a con, you know, the, the non-conference resumes with the Big 12 teams compared to the SEC and ACC teams are vastly different. So whereas in the ACC or SEC, you know, beating each other up doesn't really hurt you too much. If anything, it, it might actually help some of the bottom feeders. Um, in the Big 12, it, it is hurting you because you you lost what 14 you know percent more of your non-conference games. Yeah, it, it was a go ahead, Joe. I will say one note on on UCF, which I find interesting. I mean, they were a host in the Nerdcast you guys did two weeks ago. Now they yeah. won't be this time around. And you look at it, and they're in tenth place, and they're eight and ten in the league. However, a couple yeah. things to consider. One is they actually have the best RPI in the league at fourteen, and their schedule the rest of the way in conference. Now they have a non-conference series coming up this weekend because the Big Twelve is the Big Twelve. But then they have Cincinnati, Houston, Texas, and Baylor to finish off the season and the Texas series is at home. Like those are four winnable series for them. Yeah. So don't write them off certainly as an at large team, but like if their RPI hangs around, like could they get back into the hosting race? I wouldn't bet on it, but like that is something to watch because we know like the committee is, you're never going to go broke betting against betting on the committee to lean on RPI when it's all said and done. Yep. Very well said. Good and you know, well, I, well, I, well, it will be interesting this week and they play CMU who has a, you know, they typically do a really nice job. I mean, they got a 279 RPI. Their RPI is going to go down this week, and the question is yeah. how much. Yeah, yeah, and they're playing four against Central Ooh. Michigan. Yeah, yeah. that's somebody, somebody needs, needs to, to leave on the sprinklers. That's right. What you said, Kendall. Yeah, and it's, it's <laughs> when we, like a week ago today, uh, the big, Big 12 had 10 teams within three games of first place. And then what happens to your point, Kendall, West Virginia, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma all go 3 and 0. So it just, it feels like this, this league is, is crazy week to week and well straight to the sounds runes like i know this sounds very odd considering where they are in the standings but like i think tcu is clearly a better team than texas yet there are a couple of games behind them in the standings i guess we'll find out this weekend they play this weekend yeah yeah and te texas with that bloated rpi it's just very very odd so let, let me let me give you a couple thoughts on the the pack 12 so okay. You know, the Beavers continue to do their thing. Like they're they're they just kind of seem like they're gonna just separate themselves. Cal swept the series and now they're up to eight and ten, which is you know interesting. I think I bring that up because Cal I think has real talent. They just weren't playing well in league. Utah is now twenty three and eleven. How about Arizona? It has, is five and one versus Northeastern and Louisiana Tech, who are two teams that are doing that are helping that Arizona resume. Not that it needs help. I'm starting to wonder about, like, Oregon, to me, felt like the second best team in the league, but their RPI is not glorious, and they, they're they not sweeping. They're, like, like Oregon has literally gone two and one five straight weekends. So go wherever you want on that, guys, but the, the Pac-12, it, it's getting more interesting, which is encouraging, I think. Yeah, I, I'm with you on the Pac-12 runes. I mean, Cal, I, I'm glad you mentioned Cal. You know, I, they were front of mind for me today. Uh, they have Oregon State at home this coming weekend. Their RPI did go up last weekend from the from the big weekend they had. But, you know, they're one of those clubs that, you know, certainly has the frontline talent to go on a run. If you're looking for kind of a, a Pac-12, now with USC losing a series, a Pac-12 team that can emerge, can go on a run, get in the postseason, maybe didn't expect. I think Cal would be that team for me. You know, I mentioned a minute ago about winning percentages out of conference, guys. Uh, the Pac-12, 60% winning percentage out of conference. The ACC and SEC, 20% higher. And it's interesting, I was talking to Pac-12 coach today just about the RPI because one of the big discussions was Oregon sitting at 63 in the RPI, which that that's flawed. I mean, they are way, way better than 63. I mean, 25-10 overall, 10-5 in conference. Uh, I really like the front end of the rotation. R.J. Gordon's been red hot. Grayson Grinzel's a really nice pitcher for them, too. Uh, they're way better than that. But the problem is, Runes, is the West is down as a whole. And, and for the most part, every single weekend they're playing is hurting their RPI more and more. And it's just a very weird year out there. Yeah, the non-conference was just death knell. They, the Pac-12 yeah. was terrible in the non-conference, and you just can't undo that. You can. Yeah. What, what I will say, though, is that some of these teams can just get in the tournament – 
I think they can surprise some people because I don't think they have bad teams. Yep. I think they're just teams that have been torpedoed by the RPI to some degree. And in and, and like USC's case, just a really slow start. Like the team that played TC and A&M is not the team that USC has today. Well said. Yeah, it's amazing how much how much different USC season might have been if they didn't just go through that period of time where they just were non-competitive against some good teams. Yeah. They pick off a win or two, they're, they're probably in a, a very different place. I, I continue to be fascinated by Utah. They've got winnable series against Washington and UCLA the next two weekends. Those are the two last place teams in the Pac-12. Now, it would be very Pac-12 if those teams <laughs> kind of figure it out the next two weeks and make it to where Utah can't be a regional team. That would be a very Pac-12 thing to have happen, but I gotta give. I think we've all doubted Utah this season at various points. Like, oh, this is fun. Like, this is cool. Like, Utah is not good very often. Like, this is great, but this isn't gonna last, right? And yet they they keep coming. And if they win these next two series, like, there's a pretty good chance they're ranked at some point. Um, but yeah. yeah, so I I find that fascinating. And quickly on Oregon, I'll, I'll do this since Aaron's not here because he's typically the guy. Like, their RPI problems almost exclusively stem from the fact they played four games against Lafayette and four games mm-hmm. against Seattle U. That's yeah. eight games against like RPI 260 and above. Now, some of that's self-inflicted and self-immolation. Like, why do you have to play four? Like, I understand scheduling in the North Pacific Northwest is hard, but like, so you'll just play 52 games this year instead of 56, you know? Like, so some of that is just self-inflicted wounds, but that's that's largely why their RPI is where it is, which is silly because... Those are eight games yeah. they won handily, and it's it's just counting. Well, it, you know, it's making it to where it's hard for them. Yeah, that that's a very good point. And and this was the this is the advice I'd give coaches, especially out west, that you know you may run into some of these RPI problems. That you know Oregon goes to Dallas right and plays at Globe Life. Like if you're a wise, hey, like go go spend a Tuesday and Wednesday playing Texas or Texas A and M. Go to same Houston. You know, like going to same Houston is not going to hurt you in your in the RPI. It's only going to help you. So I would, I would recommend some of these coaches when they go on the road and go to some of these areas like Texas and maybe even Florida, like stay a little longer if you can and try to play some teams on the road that, you know, may have a better RPI than Seattle U or, you know, somebody like that. You know, what's interesting too, Kendall is like part of the, re- like one of the criticisms I I've criticized the West often in the yeah. past for, they just play each other in the non-conference too much. And then they just beat each other up. And so there is that part of it. But I, but if I put my my scheduling hat on and I'm a coach in the Southeast, I don't think I would play a West Coast team. Because why would I do that when I know I'm going to play a team that's more talented than their record would ultimately be? You know, like I, I want to play teams yeah. that have a good record and like, like, you know, no offense, but if I'm Nick Mingione, I, I – I would be way smarter to go play USC upstate on the road than to go play USC on the road, right? Like, cause USC upstate's got a chance to boat race the big South and USC is probably going to get clipped a bunch in the PAC 12. Yeah. The, 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 so I, I agree with you generally runes. I do think that is the, the motivation structure that keeps that from happening. The other thing, but what I would say though, is that especially in the SEC, you know, Mississippi State plays Alcorn State in the midweek. They know that's not going to be a good RPI game. Yeah. But it, it's because it doesn't really matter. Like if they win 16 games in the SEC, like the RPI is going to take care of itself. One game against Alcorn is not going to upset the apple cart there. So um, so yeah, I mean, I I understand like you have to act kind of in self-interest, but like I would say that if you're coming from an SEC perspective and you just know the most important data point on our resume every year is going to be number of sec wins. I would, I would make the argument, unless you're talking about playing a big West team that always finishes eighth in the league. Like that's obviously a red flag, but a a, a decent PAC 12 team. Like, I just don't think there's a lot of downside to be honest with you, because as much as USC has struggled this season, their RPI is in the top 80, but that's not really, it's not really going to hurt you. So I just think there's not, not for sec in particular, there's not a ton of downside. Yeah, can they, I give you can I give you a statistic that kind of gives you an idea of just how down the West is in general? Arizona State guys and, and Cal State Fullerton have a combined na- nine national championships. They play a two game midweek uh, series this week. They are a combined twenty eight and forty this year. Not good. Yeah, that's not good. And what's going to be interesting is that when we get to draft day in July, which is not you know it's a barometer of talent or projected talent. Yeah. The Pac-12 is going to have a bunch of kids drafted, like 
worst case scenario, the Pac-12 is going to be the third conference in draft picks. Worst case scenario behind the SEC and the ACC. And but their non-conference performance does not speak to that, in my opinion. You yeah. know, like the, the man, it's crazy. Well, the concern here. So here, I mean, let's just be very honest here, like guys. I mean, the concern I have for the West Coast schools this year is and, and trust me like i'm not advocating for this but like if you're a premier player at some of these schools where your rpis 120 or 130 uh you have no shot to make the postseason and you're a premier player at one of these pac-12 teams like you can bet that people are going to be knocking down your door on the portal to go in the portal and go to the sec go to the acc and conferences like that so i think that's the next battle for them they're, they've already been fighting that i think they're going to fight it more than ever this offseason well, and the other thing that's funny is like when we talk about West Coast baseball from now on, we're basically talking about the Big West, right? Like there is, there's, it's like the Big West and the WCC, right? Like these, it's, it's, it, I mean, maybe, I don't know, is the Big 12 our new West Coast conference or I, God only knows. What I'll say that, I mean, this is a, re, I think is UCLA, this is particularly from a recruiting standpoint, I think is as UCLA transitions to the Big 10, I think having a really bad season right before that is not good for them because i mean they'll continue to recruit at a high level but like you struggle and then you're going to a cold weather conference that just to me it seems a little bit like a double whammy we'll see but that's what it seems like to me on a, on a positive note runes we've talked about arizona and how well they're playing and it yeah it strikes me with their pitching we talked about this before we went on the air like with their pitching that is kind of because they're they're going to get moved east just a matter of how far east to play a regional like that's mm -hmm. a nightmare two seed with with their level of, of talent particularly on the mound so if you you know if you're a team that you know in the southeast that plays in a bigger ballpark and you draw arizona like that could be a really tough matchup yeah yep hey let me let me tease the nerd there's a nerd cast this week kendall right uh yes we'll be recording it uh tomorrow afternoon Okay, so let me just, we'll tease this as a nerd cast. So other interesting results from the weekend were, you know, US, UCSD won the series over UC Irvine at UCSD. You know, it was an incredible series as far as like went to the last pitches of game three of the series. Um, you know, UC Irvine and Santa Barbara's RPIs are still very, very strong. However, we know the Big West is not good for RPIs. And remember, UCI and UCSB will have to play six more weekends because they don't have a conference tournament. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. You know, the Sun Belt is going to be very interesting because we know there's good teams. It's not doing great from an RPI standpoint. So I can't yeah. wait to see how the the uh, the Nerd Master General instructs you guys to handle the Sun Belt. Yeah, I mean, Louisiana Runes. I mean, they're a top 25 ball club and they've got an RPI around 50. Yeah, yeah. Again, crazy. the RPI is a little flawed in some areas this year so far. Big 10 is very interesting. Rutgers is not a team that I'm willing to quit yet. They had won a series versus Nebraska. Um, a, a cool conference, like the Big East has five teams with palatable RPIs, which is really cool. A really, you know, Xavier, Creighton, St. Yeah. John's, UConn, and first place Georgetown, really fun. Another thing that I think will be interesting is the American. East Carolina is very good, but they're not even in first place. Uh, you, Joe, you had a great analogy for ECU where it's like they had gotten so far away from the rest of the American where like if you're on the beach, you couldn't even see the boat anymore. Mm -hmm. And and now with this new league like UTSA and at Florida Atlantic and Wichita State's having a nice year. That's interesting. You know, the, the Valley continues to be awesome at RPI. Indiana Bruce, State. Can we get your awesome thoughts on Indiana State being eight in the RPI? You know, I have two Indiana State games coming up in the next month. Yes. They're yeah. they're awesome. Like Indiana State is just awesome. But there are hey, three games. Like, They've only played twelve conference games. They're three games up on everyone else already. Yeah. And UIC's having a great year. Murray State's got a great RPI. Here's one more league I want to give you guys. Um okay. Conference USA Ooh. has gotten interesting suddenly. Rough What's that? Rough weekend for Conference USA. Yeah, yeah. But Western Kentucky keeps winning. Liberty and Western Kentucky played this weekend. Louisiana yeah. Tech getting swept by Arizona, not help, not helpful. But we know DBU is good. Anyway, I just I thought DBU was just going to dust Conference USA. Au contraire, that has not happened. So um, yes, Kendall, you guys can feel free to comment there. But I am very interested to see how the Nerd Council handles all of those leagues this week. Yeah, you know what's really interesting about DBU is, I mean. Losing a losing back to back series is tough. I mean, they lose a series at WKU, then lose a series at Air Force at a conference. Um, I think the biggest thing for them is, 
you know, they, they haven't played quite as well since James Elwinger went down with an injury. Mm. Uh, and if he, when he comes back, it's going to be kind of off and on. It sounds like it's a little bit of a nerve issue. So, you know, they were really rolling when they had him kind of penciled in that, that back end spot in the rotation. Um, you know, the biggest thing for DBU now is can, can they do enough the rest of the regular season to stay in the top 16 hunt right now? They're probably out. Um, and they rightfully so after back-to-back series losses of those teams, but you know, that's the question mark with me. I mean, after that, uh, you know, Conference USA has a lot of work to do from an RPI standpoint. I mean, DBU would be in, but outside of that, I mean, you're looking at a league right now that probably doesn't get another bid. I mean, Western Kentucky or Western Kentucky for as good of a job that Mark Reardon has done with that club. I mean, they're 93 in the RPI. So yeah. uh, it could be a one bid league despite being a very competitive league. Yep. Joseph, can I can I cajole you to comment on the Big East? Because you are you are a stadium connoisseur. Like I'm thinking about Xavier's got a really cool park. Creighton plays in the same park as our national championship. St. John's, I don't know the name of their park, but it's in Queens. What's not to like about that? Yeah, it's gotta you, be cool. Yeah, UConn's Jack, got a Jack brand Kaiser new park. Stadium. Oh, that, that's right. I should have known that. And then that. Georgetown, don't they play at a very like fancy no, I think they park? play in like a city field. No, they they, uh, they moved this year to a minor league park, kind of on the uh, Virginia side of of DC. Oh, okay, and they have a yeah. Twitter account that follows them and criticizes us for not promoting the Big East enough. So there you go, <laughs> Big East baseball catching yeah, a he, fever. I'll tell you what, Ed, Edwin Thompson, you know, probably won't win Coach of the Year. Let's be honest. I mean, just because there would be so many guys ahead of him in the pecking order. But that guy's done an incredible job with Georgetown this year. And they've got a top 50 RPI. They're legitimately, legitimately in the at-large hunt right now. Uh, they've only lost nine games. Uh, they've done a terrific job this year. And, and that is not an easy place to win, to say the least. Uh, agreed. Yeah, you could kind of see it coming. I saw them two falls ago and was like, oh, this – like the younger players on this roster are the better players. Like it's yeah. like, I, I felt like you could kind of see it coming. Um, yeah. I'm fascinated by the big East. My only gripe is that their games are on flow sports, which makes it harder to see them. Um, oh, man. That's we gotta real, clean that up. That's a real sticking point, except for St. John's St. John's for some reason still plays theirs on, you know, watch ESPN. I'm not, there's some contract thing there, I guess. Jack, I have, a, I have a, yeah, that's right. He's got a connection. Uh, Jack Kaiser Stadium was one of the original stadiums on the MVP 06 college baseball video game. Uh, there were only like 16 real stadiums, and Jack Kaiser was one of them. Um, I think they were going for geographic, you know, diversity there. Um, regardless, yeah, I think I think it's a fun a, a fun league, and and I'm I'm pretty bullish big picture on the Big East because I th- I do think there are some programs heading in the right direction. So there's that. Like obviously Creighton's usually good, UConn's usually good, Xavier's solid. Georgetown is better, yada, yada, yada. But also, like, this is not, how do I phrase this? The the Big East has money. Now, it's basketball money. It's not football money. But this is not like some of these mid-major conferences that play FCS football, low-level FCS football, and don't have any sort of revenue sports. Like, the Big East just won a national title in basketball, uh, men's basketball. They play in front of sold out arenas, like every one of those brands in basketball, you go down the list, Georgetown, a eh, little less St. John's, UConn, Creighton, Xavier, Villanova, Seton Hall, Butler. Those are places that are selling out every single home basketball game. Like, so this is not the weak sisters of the poor in terms of financial pieces of it. Again, basketball money is different yeah. than football money, but like, I'm kind of just fascinated by how that could potentially trickle down to other sports like baseball, for example, because th- like that yeah. sport, that conference is thriving in that sport. Yeah, there's there's no question. And, you know, one, one team that's really interesting, speaking of national champions, uh, UConn, you know, guys, they got up to a really slow start this year. But, I mean, go look at them now. I mean, they're up 21 spots in the RPI over the last week. They they won a series against St. John's. They won a series against Xavier two, week, two weekends ago. Uh, they are at Georgetown this weekend, which will actually help them from an RPI standpoint. They play Kansas State in BC in midweek. You know, the overall record isn't great. They've got a lot of work to do there. But in terms of RPI, guys, this could be a team that's in the large discussion uh, as we sit here in a week. And so uh, Jim Penders kind of has their club rolling a little bit. Oh, love love us some Jim Penders. That is that that coaching staff's been together for a long, long time. They, boys, they, as Marcus Peters would say, they ain't done yet. <laughs> they ain't done yet. Uh, let's cap it there, boys. Kendall, we got a safe pitch count for you for the Nerdcast. Excited to dive into another Nerdcast this week. The Nerd Master General, 
Um, you know, even though he's second place in the Chinook Cedary uh, <laughs> weekly picks, Mark, that should not, uh, Mark's credibility is still at the highest level. Um, if you do not have a sub yet to d1baseball.com or SEC Extra, then you need to do that. Uh, type in 24 season when you check out for 24% off. You could also type in uh, French is an outrage. You could type in Jack Kaiser Stadium. Um, you know, whatever we, you could type in, we ain't done yet. Type in, we ain't done yet. See what happens. Um, and so I uh, want to also. a good idea. I might do that sometime. Like, yeah. you know, make it like a 90% off coupon. It's like. <laughs> We ain't done yet. Just see if there's somebody that actually does it. Somebody's listening. <laughs> um, I, I want to also encourage you guys. Joe's way uh, weekend waypoints. Uh, I was on the road this weekend. They were like have breakfast on Saturday and Sunday morning. Tune into Joe's. Read your daily. Read your D1 digest. Get caught up on the night before, and then listen to weekend waypoints with Joe. Uh, the show is so good, Joe. You have a sponsor every day, a different sponsor each day. Is that do I have that correct? Except Fridays. But hey, if you're a business that's listening to this and you would like to sponsor my <laughs> Friday yeah. weekend waypoints videos, go to YouTube, check them out, see what you like. Um, so good. And then, yeah, let, let's talk because, yeah, we'd love to have a Friday sponsor. But yes, for Saturday and Sunday, we absolutely do runes. We're out here grinding. Yeah, they're like fireside chats, Joe. It's like it's. I feel it like it's good. Mr. Rogers when I was a kid. Just Joe. No, I had to. I had, yeah. Runes I actually had somebody come up to me at the AM game of the day, a media member, and go, "Hey, yeah, uh, by the way, that uh, you know that video that Joe does every day is really awesome. I'm glad y'all added that." So yeah, kudos yeah. to you, Joe. Nice. Yeah, well I'll, see, I'll give you credit. I will not give Aaron credit for anything. No, no, French. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, Aaron, and the great, the great wafer dispute of 2024. Him versus mm. the country of France. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it's as he would say, they're wafers. They're not proper crackers. Uh, but that's it. Let's leave it there. Uh, it, we will catch you Wednesday. Well, we'll 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 tune in Wednesday night for the Nerdcast, and then Thursday night we'll have our our preview. I I am thinking very much about Tennessee at, at Kentucky. There'll be a lot to talk about. Um, that is it. Everybody have a great week, and we'll catch you next time on the D1 Baseball.